This episode of Motoring Box is proudly supported by Century Batteries. Welcome back to Motoring Box. I'm Sean McCaller and today we are doing a Q&A session. You guys seem to love these and I haven't done one for years. The last one, in fact, I think may have been in an industrial estate back in 2020. So let's go through some of the questions which you guys have submitted. So I've tried to put these in some semblance of an order, but uh, let's just go through them anyway and uh, see what we've got. So the first one is from Jay Siv who says, how do you juggle being a dad, going to work and making YouTube videos while also having time to work on the cars? So much respect. Thank you, mate. <laughs> really appreciate that. I think it is something that is way harder than many people realize until you actually have kids. Uh, kids take over your life. The next question as well from where we go one we go all. Uh, he's actually two years old now so just over two years old so that's how long that I've been dealing with this and don't get me wrong being a dad is awesome it's one of the best things in the world but it takes your life and it flips it. You don't have a lot of spare time anymore. Your life becomes your kids. And the only reason I'm filming this here right now at this moment is that my son's having a nap. So he naps for about two hours a day. And that's really the time I get on the weekends. So one or two days a weekend for two hours, I get to come down here and film. That's why my videos over the past two years have mainly been down here and not as in depth as they used to be because it's all about time. Uh, I obviously work full-time as well, which uh, there's a few questions relating to that later. So we'll touch on that again, but yeah, you get very good at juggling your time and there's not a single minute that's wasted. So I won't drag on that topic for too long because it's probably a boring one for a lot of people. Uh, but the next one from number one fan says, do you have any tips or tricks when it comes to hunting down the rare items that you are after? For example, the mobile office, the tissue box and the Magna. Uh, there aren't really many tips. I would say that I look predominantly on Facebook. I used to use Gumtree as well and that is still something you can use today but probably not as popular as it used to be. So Facebook, Gumtree, uh, also Google search. So would you believe when I was on the market for a Magna Rally Art or just any decent Magna, uh, I was actually using Google. I would type in Magna Rally Art and I would do a Google image search and then you can also tweak the time. So I think I did uh, items from the past week and that would filter down and it will actually show you images of cars that are listed, whether they're on Facebook or on car sales or anywhere. Those images will turn up on an image search. So if you type in Magna Rally Art, filter those results. Uh, I actually saw this picture, a picture of this car on Google Images. So I clicked on it, it took me to Facebook or to Gumtree, I can't remember which one. And that's actually how I found it. So. Google search or image search is a really good one because you can literally see the cars in the pictures. Uh, but yeah, do keep an eye on Facebook Marketplace. The only other tip for Marketplace and Gumtree is to search often. You can set up alerts where items are listed matching the criteria which you set in the alert that it will actually send you email notifications and things like that. Um, I usually don't bother. I just go on there often and search often. So for Magna Rally Arts, um, I was searching multiple times a day, every day. Same with the XR6 Turbo as well. I was on Marketplace probably 10 or 20 times a day just looking. And when that car actually was listed, it was only on there for 15 minutes before I found it. I pounced on it and I bought it within the hour. So that's kind of what it takes uh, with some of those rare or difficult to find items. Kyle says, I went to buy a rally art in New South Wales for $8,000, but it was two times worse than yours when you bought it. How did you manage to get such a decent price for a rally art? Um, I'd wonder firstly how you judged it was two times worse because this car was pretty bad. It was in a very bad state. <laughs> it was in very poor condition. Um, I think it would have scared a lot of people off just because of how it looked. Uh, when you looked at it and sat in it, it just felt old and worn out. Everything just felt like it was trashed. So, you know, I think, yeah, that definitely scared a lot of people off. And when you looked at the car and then you looked at the price, five and a half grand in the end, it seemed a little bit steep, but I kind of got a bit lucky with this car in that the mechanicals, the engine, the gearbox, the driveline, uh, they all seem to be really healthy. And uh, that's obviously a huge part of buying a car. So the rest of it, apart from the paint, which we haven't done yet, but the rest of it I was able to take care of. When you're looking for rare items, you know, whether it's a Magna Rally Art or an AU Falcon office table or anything like that, 
when they come up, especially an office table, you're never going to see one again for at least a couple of years, probably. So do you pay the price that the person wants to, to charge for it or do you miss out? You know, it's up to you to make that call. And that's really what it came down to with the Magna as well. If I didn't buy this one, I've only seen a handful of cars pop up since then. Uh, none of them were manuals. So was it worth five and a half grand? <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, it's all about timing and yeah, some of these things are just hard to find these days, unfortunately. James Torrens, do you have a favorite four cylinder car? And is there a car that people hate, but you like? As in, do you like any controversial cars? First question, favorite four cylinder. I don't drive many four cylinders. They don't really float my boat. Um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say a Honda Jazz, the first generation GD. They are actually quite fun cars. If you can find one in a manual with the 1.5 liter VTEC engine, they go great. You know, you could lower one, you could throw some wider wheels and sticky rubber on there and you would have a ball. Like they actually go really well. I think they're about a thousand kilos or maybe slightly less. And the engine, I think it's like 80 kilowatt or something, 70, but they go really well. So yeah, I don't drive many four cylinders. So that's like, I know that's not a, a desirable four cylinder car, but they're pretty cool. Uh, and when it comes to a car that I like that people hate, I don't know if people hate this car per se, or it's definitely not controversial, but I really love the Mazda 929 HC hardtops. So I'll put a picture on screen. This one's actually on Facebook Marketplace at the moment for about five or five and a half thousand. I think it's a steal. These cars, they're kind of like Mazda's NC Fairlane in a way. Um, when I was growing up, uh, a girl that I went to school with, her dad was the principal of the school and he drove one of these cars and I just saw it in the parking lot every day and I thought, man, that looks cool. You know, it's kind of that 90s brick uh, kind of a car. Um, I would buy this one if I had the space and the cash, but uh, yeah, it's something I might look at one day, but yeah, it kind of has a similar problem to this car, I think, is that parts will probably be hard to find. Um, body parts and things like that. You might be um, up against it when it comes to that. So Mazda 929 HC hardtop, pretty cool, I reckon. Someone buy it and uh, let me drive it because that thing looks awesome. Finn Wren, if you could import any car of reasonable price, what would it be? Reasonable price. In, when I think imports, I think of Japanese cars. Um, there's not really any European cars that I am interested in that I would have to import. Uh, so when it comes to Japanese cars, see a lot of the cool stuff is not reasonably priced anymore. Even R34 sedans, like the one I used to have, are probably way up there when it comes to price. So there are actually two cars that spring to mind here. Um, and if you wanna see them, go to Benny's Custom Works on YouTube because he's bought both of them. One of them is a Mitsubishi Pajero Mini, which I think is pretty cool. It's like a, a K car version of a Mitsubishi Pajero. Uh, four wheel drive, a 660cc turbo engine. Uh, looks pretty cool. Uh, the other one is a Toyota Crown Saloon. So they use them as taxis in Japan. And when I was in Japan a couple of years ago and I saw all those cool taxis getting around, mostly in black, it's like, man, they look pretty cool. I'd love to bring one over and do something with it. He's got one of those too. So uh, even though we are quite different personality wise, we have similar taste when it comes to cars. I love his Viper as well. A similar question from Jaden is what's your dream car? Now, I don't really have many dream cars. I love to sort of stay within the realm of what I can afford and uh, what's within my reach. So that's, that's mainly these kind of things. If I had to pick something, I would probably say a new Nissan GTR. They are really hard to find and get these days just because of the availability. <laughs> uh, but I saw one on the road recently and they still look fantastic. If not, you know, an R34 GTR in white or Bayside blue would be awesome. If you're talking closer to home, I'd probably say an FGX Sprint, the, the six cylinder turbo one. They're still around 70 or 80,000. So not super far out of reach, but still chasing a decent amount of money there. Alex Liberty 100, would you consider buying an FG Falcon? I have an AU and an FG. Hard to say which is better because they're both great cars. Uh, similar to my last answer there, I would really love to buy an FG. It wouldn't have to be a turbo or a sprint, uh, even like a G6 or a G6E. It would be nice to own one of the last Falcons ever made because that, that's the newest Falcon you can get and they're not, obviously not making any more of them. So uh, it would be cool to have one of them as a daily driver, I think. Next one from Chimpy02. One car you regret selling and your favorite car engine. 
Uh, I've actually done a video on cars that I've owned and sold previously. I'll put it up in the corner. Biggest regret is probably an R34 GT Turbo Skyline. It was a four-door sedan. Check the video, it's got all the details in there and all my regrets. Uh, I sold it very cheaply, $12,000 there worth about 30 now. So, uh, and favorite car engine, it's probably the Barra Turbo uh, or the Intec. I really love Ford 6s. Any Ford 6 from um, the overhead cam models upwards, love them. Cameron 53, do you have relations to Moog from Mighty Car Mods? Now there are three ways you can interpret this. Uh, one, do, am I related to him? Uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm not. Um, have I met him and, and know him? Yes, I have. Uh, and in a way, the following question, Knight, what do you do for a living? That relates to this. I actually work for Century Batteries in Carroll Park. And Century Batteries actually sponsored Mighty Car Mods for uh, a period of around three years. Uh, that was something that I was responsible for. I saw it as a really good uh, fit. They actually used Century Batteries already. Um, and through that, I got to meet Marty and Moog. I flew to Sydney. Uh, I got to see their filming space. I got to see Too Sexy, who was in the garage at the time. Um, really great guys. And whatever you think they're up to, they're up to way more than that. They are extremely busy guys, extremely talented and they've got a lot of different projects on the go. So I really admired their work ethic and what they've been able to do, um, you know, what they've been able to build up over the past probably 15 years now. Other takeaways, apart from uh, just being awesome blokes, they're very tall. They're at least probably five or 10 centimeters taller than me, both of them. Matthew Taylor, without giving it away completely for obvious privacy reasons, uh, what do you do for a job? I've always wondered at what stage YouTube has transitioned to full-time content creation and whether it's an option you've considered. So as I mentioned, I work for Century Batteries in their marketing department. Uh, I do lots of things, uh, websites, social media, um, some uh, graphic design jobs and things like that. So if you look at the labels on the Century Batteries, I designed those. I did the bridge at Bathurst. Many, many different projects uh, that we work on there every day. I'm uh, doing a lot of filming uh, for them at the moment too. Uh, tutorials and educational things, which you'll see on the YouTube channel soon. When it comes to making the transition to a full-time YouTuber, um, it's definitely something I would love to do, but it is very difficult depending on your life situation. So. When you're my age, late 30s, you have a mortgage, you have a family, you have a son. You've got a lot of responsibilities that you have to take care of and you can't take risks with those things. So if you're a young bloke, 19, you know, early 20s, uh, you may be still living at home um, or you, you know, you rent a share house with people, you can survive on a lower income. Take the plunge, you know, people like Rex H have done that. It's easier, but when you're older, things get locked in. So the level that I would have to hit to do YouTube full time is very high. It's probably in the order of something like $10,000 a month because arguably you probably need about 5,000 a month to live, to pay for all of the things that I need to pay for. And then you also need to create content and car content is very expensive to create. You know, there's some videos where I've paid uh, something like $1,700 for parts. So say wheels and tires. It cost you $1,700 to film a video about that. So yeah, it's earning the money to live, but then it's also earning above that to keep making content. Very difficult with cars. So yeah, Stephen, that is definitely something I've thought about. Um, it was the goal when I started and I may still hit it one day, but uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. Jimmy J, do you do the filming and video editing? Which software do you use? Great video. Really enjoy watching the effort you put into them. Yes, I do all of the filming. Um, that's why a lot of the shots you see are stationary. No one's holding the camera. It's on a tripod. Uh, I filmed a little video explaining how I do it, which I'll link up here in the corner. But basically uh, I have a, two cameras. I have a couple of GoPros, uh, I have a drone um, and I use Adobe Premiere for the editing. So if you want to know more, check that video out. It'll tell you basically everything you need to know to become a YouTuber, if that's what you want to do anyway. So recently on the channel, the Magna has been the flavor of the month. I've got a few questions in relation to that. Keely says, when are you gonna sell me your rally art? Keely, uh, I actually have your number because you bought uh, something from my shop. <laughs> um, I'll give you a call if I wanna sell it. Uh, I don't wanna sell it anytime soon. HG Media also has a similar question. His wife doesn't want him to buy a BMW Z3, so she would like the Magna, she probably would. An interesting thing, if you look at the next question from Mr. Maestrom, do you use your rally art as a daily driver or do you slash plan to in the, in the future? 
Uh, could it replace your AU? It already has. <laughs> I've been driving this car almost every day, especially to work. Anytime I need to go out, I take the Magna. Uh, it's probably partly because it's still new to me. Uh, it's still fresh. I really love driving it. And that's why um, this old AU, I've literally pulled this out from under a car cover. It hasn't driven for one or two months. Probably as soon as this car hit the road, this one went off the road. Well, it's still registered, but I just haven't driven it. Uh, I've lost a, a Ford logo from the center cap for some reason. And also the, the rotors are really rusty just because it hasn't been driven. If you look at the next question from Gemini Wagon on a level of one to 10, one being not so smug and 10 being super smug, how smug do you feel whilst driving the Magna? Uh, it's so cool. Thanks, mate. Uh, smug has a negative connotation to it. Uh, but when you look up the definition of smug, uh, I think it's something to do with um, how happy you feel with, with yourself. Uh, and if you look at it that way, I'm extremely happy that I bought this car and, and what I've been able to do with it. I'm really proud of it. Uh, and that's getting back to the previous question. Um, you know, I'm driving this thing every day. That's partly why, because... Prior to seeing and buying this car, I actually don't remember ever seeing a Magna Rally Art with my own eyes on the street. I probably have, but I don't remember it. So getting this car out there and getting people seeing it, I think it's really awesome because I'm hoping, you know, if I take it to work and I get on the highway, I hope that at least one person would see it and go, hey, it's a Magna Rally Art. I haven't seen one of them for years. So yeah, I really enjoy taking it out every single time. David Wilton, how does the Magna build quality and reliability compare to Falcons? I've always liked Falcons the most out of the Aussie built cars. Uh, loves the content. Thank you very much. Um, this is really interesting. Um, when I bought the Magna, I had this really foreign feeling. It was a real nervous kind of a thing. Like I was looking at this car and I didn't know anything about it uh, apart from basic specs, you know, but I'd never been in one. I'd never tried to work on one or fix anything. So I didn't know how any of the bits came apart. You know, how do you take off the center light in the interior or pull apart the dashboard? You know, I didn't know a thing, uh, but bit by bit, uh, you get used to it. I actually had a similar feeling when I bought the BA, but you get comfortable with the car over a couple of weeks and then, yeah, you know, almost everything about it. The Magna doesn't have the same feeling of solidity that uh, a car like the AU or the BA has, they feel like bigger, heavier, more robust cars. You know, when you sit in the seat and you drive it, everything just feels more substantial. Uh, and that's reflected as well in their weights. The, the Falcons are heavier by one or 200 kilos, I think. Um, the Magna feels smaller, lighter, dare I say it a little bit more flimsy when it comes to the seat material, the way the seats are made. Um, the backs of the seats are literally like a cardboard or, or uh, MDF panel wrapped in fabric and you, they just pop out, you know, they, they really feel like they're sort of cobbled together a little bit. <laughs> um, but don't get me wrong. They're still very well built cars, but they just have a very different feeling to Falcons. And that's probably the only negative that I can think about it for now. So yeah, don't get me wrong. I think the Magnus are very well built cars, but they feel very different. If you've been around Falcons all your life, it's a bit of an adjustment getting into one of these. And I don't think they're any less reliable than a Falcon. Um, they have their own faults and, and issues just like these do. So um, probably, yeah, line ball on that topic. Tim, are you going to Mitzfix to convert the Magna to a 380 engine? Um, don't see the point. Uh, the engine in this is already a rarity. You know, it's a really special engine, so I'm going to keep it. I don't see the point in spending the money unless it blows up and I have to, uh, to get, you know, 20 or 30 extra kilowatts. Uh, I think it's worth keeping this engine in this car. And if I was, I definitely wouldn't go to Mitz Fix. I don't know if you're taking the piss on that one, but uh, that would be the last person on my list I would go to. GMHX77, do you have any plans for a different car or are you happy with the Magna? Lucas also wants to know if I'm planning on selling any of my cars. Uh, two similar questions. Um, if I was going to sell a car, it would be this one because I haven't been driving it. I'm not done with the BA, I'm not done with this, but this one is just sitting around. One idea I had, which I wanted to float to you guys is what if we ran a competition? But the risk of me running a competition is can I sell enough tickets to recoup the money that I could have got if I sold this thing anyway? So I estimate this thing's worth about $5,000, right? So would you enter a competition to win my Ford Fairmont gear 
for say $50 a ticket. I would have to sell about 100 to 200 tickets to make that worthwhile. Ideally 200 so that I would have enough money to uh, reinvest into a future giveaway car. You know, it's something that we could do instead of selling a car when I'm done with it. What if we ran a comp and gave it away? It would help financially boost the channel. And because I try to not be greedy about things and I try not to earn, you know, make a lot of money off this, but it is limiting my growth. So if we swap that around a bit and we ran some comps to try and boost the budget up of the channel and hopefully grow. It's not a car that's worth very much, but considering if you bought a ticket for 50 bucks and you won it, that would be an awesome starting point. You know, if you're a young bloke, you paid 50 bucks for a ticket, you won it. How awesome would it be to start off with a, a fully sort of kitted out Fairmont gear where you can decide what to do with it. Do you want to lower it? Do you want to swap the wheels out? Do you want to put a louder exhaust on it? You know, do you want to go drifting? You do you want to do anything you want? Do you just want to cruise in it as it is? Like winning a car for 50, 100 or however many tickets you bought would be pretty awesome. And it would be awesome to have a chance uh, to give you guys a chance to win it as well. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, I generally don't want to be seen as doing this as a money-making exercise because it's not, it's a, it's a hobby, it's a passion, but if I could earn more money, I can do more with it, you know, reinvest it into the channel. I wouldn't be going and buying random shit. It'd all go back into the channel. So do let me know again in the comments below. Pip Bip, long-term plans for the Magna. Not many. I want to get it painted. I haven't gone to talk to anyone about it yet because I've just been driving it and enjoying it. It is going to cost at least a couple of thousand, so I'm trying to save up for that as well. Uh, after it's painted, it's pretty much done. I'm not gonna turbocharge or supercharge or do anything else. I think it's a great car as it is. But yeah, after those things are done, there's not really gonna be much else I'm looking at. Uh, but if, if there is anything, let me know again in the comments below. Sky High, have you considered doing a road trip series, say Queensland to where the XR6 or Magna was made? Uh, and fixing the issues that arise with the car along the way. I would love that. Uh, again, though, I am a new dad, or, you know, I've had a, a kid for the last two years, he's two years old. Uh, a lot of my time I'm needed here. So it's a bit unreasonable at the moment for me to say, hey, honey, I'm going away for a week driving on the road. I would love to. Uh, it might be something I can do later. I would also love to buy a car from interstate and drive it home. There's actually one that's up for auction this weekend in Melbourne. I won't say what it is, but there's a car that's up for auction. It's probably out of my price range, but I was thinking, man, if I bid and won a car like that, you could fly down, get an unregistered vehicle permit and just drive it home uh, over the course of two days from Melbourne to, to Brisbane. Uh, I would love to do that. And it's potentially something we can do soon because it wouldn't take long to do it. Uh, but yeah, that's something I would love to do. It'd be a bit of an adventure. Lucy Goose, do you plan on getting an older muscle style car again, like your old LTDs? Uh, you had all the XCBDE. Uh, it comes down to money with those cars. They're getting really hard to find. And, you know, you can't find even an XE GL for under 15 grand in decent condition. Uh, even cars at that price range will have rust. They'll need paint. Uh, it's kind of, they're rising um, faster than, than where I can catch up. <laughs> uh, the 70s Falcons would be even worse in that regard. So I would love to, but yeah, the price of entry just to get on board with that is very high. Marty Smith, do you have any videos in the works uh, with the AU gear? Not really. Uh, I do need to get my new wheels powder coated and put on. I've just put the XR6 wheels on at the moment, which I think look hideous. Uh, the bigger the wheel you go for, the lower the car needs to be to look good. So at the moment it looks really high with these slightly larger wheels. So I do want to get uh, the wheels which I bought powder coated. They're 16s, they look way better at this ride height. Uh, and it needs new tires too. So at some point in the near future I want to get that done. And then maybe we'll give it away. <laughs> and again, Luke Murray, similar question. Congrats on the AU Fairmont Series 3 wagon. They are awesome. Um, but yeah. That's the plans on the car. Joe VD, would you go to a track day brekkie laps and are we gonna see the XR6 Turbo go down the drag strip? What performance mods are next for the BA? Uh, I really loved going to the drags in the Magna. That was awesome fun. I do wanna take this car, but also the XR6 Turbo to there as well. Uh, the XR6 Turbo can't go down the strip at the moment because I, I've touched on it a few times, but it has boost control issues, uh, which have reared their head shortly after I had it tuned. On the dyno, it was fine, uh, but on the street, in a lot of different situations, it'll hit boost cut. 
uh, which is around 20 pounds or 23 pounds or something. So I don't really want to give that car a hard time until I know that the boost control, that it has some to start with. So uh, I have a new rear housing for the turbo with a larger wastegate flapper. It still needs to be ported out and installed and it's got a new actuator and everything. Uh, it's just money. I could have gone down that route, but uh, people were a bit sick of that car, which is why I spent money here instead. Uh, but in the near future, that's something I want to rectify. Uh, once we get the boost control issue sorted, probably be a, a, a thousand or 1500 bucks or something. So as far as performance mods, it's not really extra performance. It's just trying to get reliable performance with what we've got. Harry Olna, I have a beautiful XR6T. It's a sports exhaust, cold air intake, no issues with any part of the car. What upgrades would you start with? Medium budget for upgrades. Do you want to upgrade it to start with? Um, the car's a really awesome stock. Uh, if it's got an exhaust and an intake, maybe just get it tuned. It depends. The further you stray from the car's stock power level, drivability is usually impacted as a result. You know, if you lower it, if you up, up the injectors, if you get a tune, you know, it's never going to drive as well day to day as it does stock. So bare minimum, get a tune put on it. You'll get some extra power. The car will drive the same. You'll love it. Uh, it just depends how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. Do you want to upgrade the intercooler? Um, do you want to throw bigger injectors? What else? Uh, fuel pump, you know, the sky's the limit. It depends. Uh, up to you <laughs> to answer it, but not answer the, the question at the same time. Andy, the best light globes for any B-series Falcon. I have a BF and my lights in terms of brightness suck. Something must be wrong uh, either with the alignment of your lights or the globes because the headlights on my BA are one of the brightest out of all the cars I've ever owned. They're fantastic. So yeah, it might be that you need some new bulbs. I'm not a bulb expert, but stay away from the HID or the LED options because they scatter the beam. They don't work on the reflectors, which those lights have. Either go to super cheap. I know they charge a lot for bulbs, but there are some Philips or Nava, you know, bulbs that promise X amount of percent higher than usual. Buy the brightest you can for the budget you've got. Throw them in, you'll love it. Um, the only other thing is whether the the light housings, whether the lenses are cloudy or not, if they are, you can try polish them or just buy new ones. They're not very expensive. James Milton, why did you choose the Yeah Buds over OEM? Uh, easy question to answer that one. For example, I really love the FPV Dark Argent wheels. They're a 19 inch wheel on the, uh, was it BF Typhoon? I think had them, um, loved them. At the time I was in, in the market for new wheels, uh, I couldn't find a set for under $1,500 to $2,000. Uh, for that price, the tires were all shagged and they had gutter ash as well. So they needed new tires, they needed to be refinished. With that in mind and tires, I was probably looking at at least a $2,500 or $3,000 proposition. Or the set of Simmons FRCs I think was about $1,200 and then another five or 600 for tires. So for a much cheaper price, you get a brand new set of wheels, new tires, and I'd never actually bought new wheels from a shop before or online. They were, I've always had second hands. Uh, so it was a really awesome experience. I really, really love those wheels. I think they look fantastic on my car. Didn't choose Simmons for any particular reason, just I really love that design and I couldn't find a similar design which I thought was better from any other brand. So that's why I went for those. The prices of some of these OEM wheels are ridiculous. The only other OEM Falcon wheel I like that would have suited the BA would have been a set of honeycomb wheels from an FG. Uh, there was a 50th anniversary one which had dark gray inserts on them. Those wheels alone usually go for about 800 to 1000 bucks a set. And again, they've got gutter rash or they've got clear coat bubbling. It's a nightmare. Brand new was the way to go and I don't regret it at all. Mike Stevenson, do you have the one piece tail shaft? Sadly, I don't. I actually sold it. A uh, busted knuckle garage in Bundamba had a customer who wanted one. They needed one urgently for a car that had been converted to manual. Uh, I thought, stuff it, I'll sell it. I sold it for about a thousand bucks, which was a loss uh, based on compared to what I paid for it. But let's be honest, I was not going to use it. I've only just sorted out the issues with the two piece tail shaft. Fitting the one piece meant I had to use different bolts. I couldn't use those same clip on weights that I used to fix the balance issue. Watch the video if you don't know what I'm talking about, but I've had huge issues with trying to get a tail shaft balanced on that car. I've just fixed it and it's driving brilliantly. I didn't want to bother with the one piece anymore. So it's sadly 
been sold. Cade for safe, how much money have you spent on the BA in total? I've actually filmed a video again, which I'll link up here in the corner. Uh, it's currently including the purchase price, I think it was around 21,000, but I've since bought a set of wheels, spent probably another 2,000 on it, so it's probably around 23 or something like that. Uh, still expensive, but um, the prices of those cars have risen, so considering the work I've done and how much they're worth now, it's actually not too bad. Greg says, when the BA Falcon first came out during that time in 2002, what were your first thoughts and opinions on the car? Uh, I was really excited. I was straight out of high school, uh, studying in TAFE, and I had a lot of time to watch supercars and things like that. And when I saw online about the you know, pictures of what the BA looked like when it was just about to be released, especially uh, like the GT, I was like, man, that is a good looking car. Like, especially after the AU, words could not describe how excited you felt as a Ford fan to see what the next model was going to look like. It was like a quantum leap or so it felt uh, forward from this. So um, yeah, it was definitely something that I kept a close eye on and I was on the Ford forums back then. I was reading all the reviews about the car. You know, I was really following it closely and I watched supercars all the time. Ambrose was dominating in his Pertec BA <laughs> supercar. Uh, it was a really like a peak time you know it was like the best period in time for Ford fans that I can think of and that's partly why I bought the car in the first place because I've got those memories and that nostalgia yeah really high point for Ford Australia uh, and something sadly we'll never see ever again. Beal Clarence would you consider a VS or VR Commodore for the channel? Yes if I bought a Commodore it would be one of those or the equivalent Statesman or Caprice. Uh, I really love the 90s Commodores pre-VT uh, probably VP, VR, VS. Uh, really think they're good cars. Um, definitely one I would get with either the Ecotec or the supercharged Ecotec. I'm always on Marketplace. I'm always looking at them. Uh, it's just clearing up a space in the garage, which we could, uh, you know, potentially be doing soon. Gear Spider wants to know when I'm getting an FG. I kind of touched on that before. I would love one, um, but probably not while I own two other Falcons. I'm all Falconed out at the moment. Flynn Peterson's 06, I have to ask your favorite Commodore. It would probably be a VS SS or like a, a supercharged Caprice or something from the VS, you know, the late 90s range there. Uh, not really loving the later ones like the, the VT to VY or VZ. VE, I suppose the only other one would be a VF like a, a Calais or a, an SSV Redline or something. Um, you still see a lot of them on the road. I saw a VF uh, Calais recently. It's like, man, they're a good looking car, but they're, they're still fetching a lot of coins. So that's the only issue with that one. Rebellious Reptile, what are your thoughts on the TRD Orion? Love them. Uh, but again, um, it's hard to find one for under 10,000. They're usually about 15 with sort of 200,000 Ks and smashed out front bumpers because they're so low. Uh, would love to drive one or potentially own one though. Hey DJ, which car is faster out of your full garage on a quarter mile drag? It would definitely be the BA Falcon, but I've never run that yet. Uh, it would probably run a low 13 or high 12 uh, if I can get the boost control sorted, which we ho can hopefully do soon. Definitely would be the fastest, followed by the Magna, definitely, which is a uh, low 15, is a 15.3. It would definitely do a high 14 though, if I sorted out the, um, the wheel spin issue or the track was actually prepped, which it wasn't. Uh, the AU gear, I usually, I think they're quoted at about 16 and a half seconds, so a lot slower for, yeah, it's a heavier car. It's got less power as well, so, and really bad gearing, really tall gearing on the auto there too. Jackson says, what car would you buy next? Also, do you prefer four, six or eight cylinder automatic versus manual? Uh, cars I'll buy next, it could be a Commodore. I'm even toying with an idea of buying another Fairlane, whether it's a, an NA or an NC and just um, sort of resto modding it. Uh, but it would definitely be a Commodore. Um, anything Australian made, which is in budget, I'm interested in. Right GT, do you watch motorsport? Favorite categories. As I mentioned, I used to watch supercars about 20 years ago, but I stopped not long after Ambrose quit, which is I think 2005. I don't really watch any motorsport at all these days. The closest would be some of the online uh, streamers like Jimmy Broadbent, who does online racing. Uh, that's kind of a form of motorsport, but not really watching any of the real life stuff. Sometimes F1, if it's on at a certain time or they've got highlights on YouTube or whatnot, but 
Otherwise, not much. And the last few questions are a little bit random here. We've got Troy who wants to know if I'm a dog or a cat person. A bit of both. Uh, when I was growing up, we always had dogs. They're awesome. Man's best friend, you know, growing up with a dog as a kid is a really awesome thing. You know, it's like they're your brother and uh, they're out to look after you and, you know, you have a great time. Uh, these days we have cats or we have a, a cat. We had a cat that died a few years ago. We've got another cat. We have it now. Uh, it's really good for if you've got a busy life. Cats are very low maintenance. You don't need to take them out for walks or things like that. They're always happy to lie around and sleep. You play with them a bit. You have a good time. Uh, really sweet animals, um, but obviously a lot different to dogs. Both have their pros and cons. James Gibbons, Ford Laser. No. <laughs> Ford Laser, I think, is like a budget Falcon, a front wheel drive budget Falcon. I don't really see the appeal. A lot of people love them. It might be something that you have to drive to understand, but I don't understand them at the moment. Sorry, single peg and all you guys out there who, uh, who love them. Cameron53, when was the last time you had KFC? It was probably about a week and a half to two weeks ago. There's a, a few other fast food questions here, so we'll just skip onto those two. Tank Maverick 99 is the KFC Crunch Twister Box a worthy opponent to the Zinger Box now that the Wicked Wings have been replaced with boneless chicken? I don't miss the, the Wicked Wings. I don't like wings. Nothing beats a Zinger Box. No matter what it is, the Zinger Box wins. But I would argue that a large Zinger combo is even better because it just gives you the things you need. You've got a nice Zinger burger, you've got a large chips, which is a big deal, and a large drink. That's all I need. I don't need the box. Gaswold of Eatonsville, what are your thoughts on the Red Rooster flavor wrap? I'm always impressed with them when I have them, uh, which is not often. I had one about a year ago and pretty much every time I have one, I think, wow, this is actually really good. Like surprisingly good but then I just never go back to get another one <laughs> so yeah last time was about a year ago they're great but when fast food is on the cards they're never on my list for some reason I don't know why polar spaceman Nando's or a Porto chicken I don't think I've ever had a Porto at all um, I've had Nando's a few times and I always come away thinking it's not much food for a lot of money so it's not good value and I, I don't know, it's always a bit spicy. You can go mild, but everything's still got a bit of kick to it and I just don't like it. Um, but yeah, the price, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't know why they charge as much as they do. Uh, so can't tell you, I guess technically Nando's wins because I've actually tr had it or tried it before, but I wouldn't choose either of them. And Hugh Holfeld, coolest, handiest tool we might not know of or a tool to avoid. Uh, not really. I do have a really long Phillips screwdriver. It's about this long. And I've actually used that way more than I thought I would. You know, if you've got a hose clamp deep down in the engine bay, rather than trying to get your hand down there with a, a screwdriver, you can just feed the whole screwdriver down there and just undo it. Um, yeah, I've actually been pulling that out quite a few times for different reasons. So yeah, this has been a lot of fun, guys. I really thank you for submitting all your questions. If you've got more, put them in the comments below because I do look at every single comment. I read every single comment. So if you've got a good question, pop it down there and I'll answer it there too. So yeah, I guess um, the takeaway from all this is that I am a really busy guy. You know, YouTube is just a hobby, which I do on the side. I would really love to do more with it, but being an automotive YouTuber is very expensive and props to all the guys out there who, you know, can do it full time. I would love to do that, but I cannot do that at the moment. Uh, if you've got any questions about the cars, as I mentioned, put them below. Uh, let me know definitely if you would love to see the AU being given away. Bearing in mind, tickets would have to be at least 50 bucks, but it would be a one in say 200 chance. So do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have a good one guys. I'll see you next time.